And it, the, the lyrics to it are based on uh, Psalm 115, verse 1, which says, Not to us, O Lord, but to your name be the glory. And that uh, really expresses our desire. The, those of us, we talked about this just before the service began, those of us who are up front on a Sunday morning, that is our goal, of course, that it's not to us. Your applause is not to us, but it's to the Lord's name. That's who we are here to glorify. And so let's take a moment and pray and ask him to be glorified in our time here this morning. Heavenly Father, as we open your word now, as we... Uh, hear your lessons for us from Scripture, uh, we pray, Lord, that it will be you who are is glorified uh, in our time this morning, that as we uh, learn lessons from the life of Moses, that, Lord, we can apply them to our lives in a way that honors and glorifies you, that as people observe our lives, it would be not us that they notice as much as you working through us, that you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1519, the Spanish explorer and conquistador Hernando Cortez arrived on the shores of the Yucatan Peninsula with 11 ships. This was the age of discovery and conquering. Europeans believed that North and South America were uncivilized lands that were free for whatever Europeans had the guts to take them. Of course, this was untrue. There were thriving nations already in place all over the Western Hemisphere. In particular, Mexico, where Cortez had just landed, was under the control of the Aztec Empire, which had been the undisputed power in Central America for 600 years. And Cortez landed with just 500 soldiers and 100 sailors under his command. And yet his plan was to conquer the Aztecs. Some of his men were unconvinced of success, attempted to seize some ships and sail to Cuba. Cortez got wind of the plot, captured the ringleaders, and then to make sure that the remainder of his men were completely committed to his mission and quest for riches, he did something that seemed completely insane. He gave the order to sink the ships. His men resisted, wondering how they would even get home, and his answer was, if we're going home, we're going home in their ships. The path forward for, for Cortez was clear. It was all or nothing, 100% commitment. The option of failure was gone. It was going to be conquer or die. Legend has it that the ships were burned, but historians tell us that's probably not true. In actuality, they stripped off their mast and tackle and used what they could for um, living quarters on land, and then they scuttled the boats to the bottom of the harbor. The result is the same. Cortez wrote, we're all in, and there's no turning back. After dismantling their ships, each man, as he reports, then had nothing to rely on apart from his own hands and the assurance that they would conquer and win the land or they would die in the attempt. Now, I should probably point out that while Cortez was very brave on behalf of his men, he was perhaps not so brave where his own personal safety was concerned. He actually kept one ship afloat. So ostensibly, this was so that he could send back the king's share of any loot or plunder that he found, but historians have pointed out that in the case of defeat, that one ship was available for Cortez and other selected officers to make their escape, leaving the common soldiers, you know, stranded in a hostile land. So please understand, I'm not trying to paint Cortez as a hero. But the incident has been popularized with the phrase, burn the ships. It's a way of saying that you're fully committed to a decision, that there's no turning back. As I saw it on a couple of different blogs this week, retreat is easy when you give yourself the option. It's easy to retreat when you hold the retreat as an option. Another way of saying this is burn your bridges. When you burn your bridges with a job, it means you leave in such a way that they're probably not going to hire you again. When you burn your bridges with a relationship, it means you're probably not going to be friends anymore. When you burn your bridges, it means you've made a decision that, for better or for worse, you're going to stick with. 
And there's a correspondence to the Christian life. When you become a follower of Christ, the Bible wants you to burn the ships. That is to say, when you accept the gift of salvation, you're supposed to burn your bridges with your old way of life. I'll put it like this, our big idea for this morning. The decision to follow Jesus is a choice to value the rewards of faith more than the promises of sin. My friend Matt says it like this. He says, faith means choosing Jesus decisively over a lifestyle of sin. Faith is getting off the fence. God doesn't abide fence sitters. Faith means getting off the fence and decisively choosing Christ over a lifestyle of sin. We're going to see that illustrated in our story today from the life of Moses. Last week we started a series on the book of Exodus and we learned about Pharaoh's evil intention to cleanse the earth of Israelites. But we saw last week that God was still at work. That even when things looked bleak, God was still keeping his promises, and he provided a savior in the birth of Moses and his ironic rescue from a basket in the Nile. So now today, we're going to see Moses make a choice. Moses has to choose if he's going to identify with God and with the people of God, or if he's going to identify with Egypt and the world. Our text for today is Exodus chapters 2, starting at verse 11. What we're going to do is I'm going to run through the story in Exodus, and then we're going to turn to the Bible's own sermon on this passage in the book of Hebrews. So let's look at the text first, Exodus 2, starting at verse 11. It says, One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Now, if you remember the story from last week, you know that Moses was discovered in the Nile by the daughter of Pharaoh. And when she decided to adopt him, his clever sisters suggested to the princess that she would need a Hebrew wet nurse. And so, for the first years of his life, Moses was raised by his own biological mother, Jochebed. And then after that, he he went to the palace and he was raised as a prince of Egypt. So it's not too hard to imagine Jochebed whispering to him again and again how special he was. How he was meant to be a leader in Israel. How God was preparing him for something big. And now Exodus tells us that when he'd grown up, and Acts chapter 7 suggests that he's about 40 years old at this point. Exodus tells us that he goes out to watch his own people at work. And notice that phrase, his own people. It's repeated twice here. There's a definite point being made. Even though he was raised as an Egyptian prince, he's identifying as an Israelite. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So verse 12. Looking this way and that, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Now any way you slice it, this is homicide. Um, Now, it may have been justifiable. In fact, the Hebrew word for killed that's used here is the same word used to describe the beating up in verse 11 that the Egyptian was administering to this slave. So it's possible that the Bible's trying to tell us that the Egyptian was on the verge of beating this slave to death. And so by acting in this way, Moses saved this man's life. So it may have been justifiable homicide, but still it's homicide. It's also possible, likely even, that as a member of the royal family, as Egyptian royalty, that Moses had the power and the freedom to take the life of any Egyptian he cared to take. And in that sense, too, it would have been something he would have been able to get away with. But the real clue that this was the wrong thing to do is in the actions Moses takes. First, we're told by the Bible that he looked this way and that to make sure there were no witnesses to his crime. And then he buried the body in the sand afterwards, obviously an attempt to cover it up. And Acts 7 gives a little insight into what Moses was thinking. The suggestion in Acts 7 is that Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. In other words, when Moses saw that Israelite suffering so cruelly, all the nursery stories that his mother told him as as, he was in his early ages, came back to him, and he decided that he was going to do something about it. 
He thought that by striking this slave driver, he was striking the first blow of a revolution. He thought his people would rally around him. But that's not what happened. Verses 13 and 14. The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. And he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Moses sees two Israelites fighting, he tries to intervene. Moses obviously has an ingrained sense of right and wrong, a strong sense of justice. And they shouldn't be fighting each other. They, they, they should be fighting the Egyptians, right? Revolution. But the Israelites are cynical. They've heard about what happened the day before. Probably the man whose life Moses saved has told others about it. And they're not interested in having this self-appointed judge, jury, and executioner tell them what to do. And this cynical Israelite is correct in a way. Moses is going to be ruler over them. Just not yet. So now Moses faces a tough choice. He can go back to Pharaoh explain what happened to the slave driver, reaffirm his commitment to Egypt, and he could probably get away with the crime. After all, he is a member of the royal household. Or, Moses can remain loyal to his own people. He can stand by the choice he made when he struck the slave driver, the choice to identify with the suffering of the Israelites. To do that means he leaves Pharaoh's household forever. It says here in verse 14 that Moses was afraid. Later in Hebrews 11, it's going to say that Moses did not fear the king's anger. So you're tempted to say, well, which was it? Was he afraid or not? Well, clearly, he was afraid. But by making the choice to leave Egypt, he's making the choice that is certain to arouse his adoptive grandfather's wrath. By leaving Egypt, Moses is identifying with the people of Israel and giving up his place in the royal family forever. He's burning his ships. Verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. So again, now, it's not just that Moses killed a man that has Pharaoh upset. It's that Moses is identifying as an Israelite. By killing that guard, Moses has essentially declared war on Egypt. So Moses flees to save his life, sure, but he made the choice that said he was not afraid of Pharaoh. Like the midwives of chapter 1, he feared God more than he feared man. He chose to defy Pharaoh. So Moses ends up in Midian. Midian's not a place so much as it's a tribe of wandering nomads who would have lived to the east of Egypt. There are actually quite a few connections uh, back in the book of Genesis between Midian and, and the story of God's people. The Midianites are actually, we're told, descended from Abraham through his second wife, Cathorah. It was a band of Midianite uh, tradespeople that, that bought Joseph from his brothers and actually carried him to Egypt and sold him there into slavery. Um, and, and, and Moses ends up at a well which is the social center in in that culture. That's where people would gather and meet. But but it's interesting because both Jacob and Isaac, both their wives were found at a well. So there's a little foreshadowing here because that's that's what's about to happen to Moses. Um, Verses 16 through 22. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. And some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. And when the girls returned to rule their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? And they answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Rule asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. And so Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. And Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. Drawing water for a flock of sheep is hard work. 
So these seven daughters of rule, these girls do all the hard work of filling these troughs to water their sheep, and then a rival band of shepherds arrives, they're bullies, they drive the girls away, bring their own sheep in, drink the water that the girls have drawn. We've already seen Moses has a strong sense of injustice, and so he sees this happen, he can't abide it, so he draw, we can imagine he draws his Egyptian sword, and he drives these shepherds away. And he goes the extra mile by, by drawing water himself to replace the water that these bullies have stolen. The girls are grateful, I'm sure, but they forget their manners. They go back to their father, they arrive home early, tell him the story, and he says, well, why didn't you bring the man home so that we could show hospitality to him? And so they go back, they bring Moses home, Moses ends up staying, he ends up marrying Zipporah, he ends up having a son. He names his son Gershom, which translates essentially as alien, foreigner, a foreigner in a foreign land. You see what's happening here? Moses is further severing his ties with Egypt. He's settling down. He's making a family. When he names Gershom, he says, I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. And you might think he's talking about, you know, now his living in exile and in, in, in Midian. But some scholars suggest that actually the name is a reference back to his status now in Egypt. He was a foreigner to begin with in Egypt, but now he's become a foreigner in that foreign land because he's totally distanced himself from his, his relationship with Pharaoh and the princess and the courts of Egypt. Moses is truly burning his ships. There's no way he can go back to Pharaoh's palace as a prince. And all of this is God's doing. He's in exile, sure. His people are still enslaved. But God has Moses right where he wants him to prepare him to lead his people out. So verses 23 and 24, the end of chapter 2. The narrator tells us during that long period the king of Egypt died. And the Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And God heard their groaning and he remembered the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Acts chapter 7 tells us it was for another 40 years that Moses spent in the desert. And during that time, the Israelites continued to suffer in their slavery. And God heard their cries for help. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham. Now please understand, this doesn't mean that God was deaf to their cries before. It's not like he forgot that his people were down there in Egypt, that he sort of misplaced them for a while, and it wasn't until, you know, like this alarm went off, and he said, oh yeah, I, I should do something about my promises to Abraham. It's not like that. He's heard every cry. He's never forgotten. But when the Bible uses that word remembered here, it means God's now doing something about it. God's now leaning in to action. This is the beginning of God's war on Egypt. God's getting ready to rumble. God's rolling up his sleeves. He's rehearsing his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's getting ready to act to redeem his people. And this, by the way, might be a clue as to why the Israelites did not rally around Moses when he killed that slave driver up in verse 11. That was Moses acting on his own. That was Moses trying to redeem his people in his own power. And that's not what God wanted. God is indeed going to use Moses to set his people free, but he's going to use Moses in such a way as to leave no doubt that it's God who's at work. God's purpose is not just to get his people out of slavery, but to lead them to a relationship with himself. So he's going to get the glory in this. The last verse here in the original language says simply, God saw the Israelites and God knew. And that's it. That's how that chapter ends. God knew. It doesn't tell us what God knew. But the implication is God knew it all. God knew everything. God, God saw what was happening to his people and God knew what he was going to do about it. God knew. So that's our story. Today. Exodus 2, 11 through 24. And the lesson we're supposed to learn from this again, as I said earlier, is the decision to follow Jesus is a choice to value the rewards of faith more than the promises of sin. When we follow Jesus, we're making a decisive choice to burn our bridges with sin and not look back. Now you might ask, okay, where, where does that come from in the story? And for one thing, Jesus doesn't get mentioned. It's the Old Testament. 
Um, for another, the, there's, there's nothing about faith in this story. You don't see the word sin anywhere in this story. So where do I get this lesson? Well, I'll tell you. This is actually a pretty easy sermon to put together because this is an occasion where the New Testament actually explains the story for us. This is an occasion where the sermon for this story has already been written in the Bible itself. So the passage I'm thinking of is Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 27. This is part of the Bible's great Hall of Fame of Faith chapter. And this incident from Moses' life is one of the things the author of Hebrews chose to focus on to illustrate faith for us. So here's what it says. It says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. So do you see now why I say that the decision to follow Jesus is a choice to value the rewards of faith more than the promises of sin? Do you see why I'm talking about sin? Because this verse does because because in the bible following exodus egypt begins to be sort of a symbol of sin and temptation and that's the way the author of hebrews sees it egypt equals temptation and sin but moses chose faith moses chose god and god's people and by extension then hebrews says moses chose jesus even though he didn't know the name yet moses chose god and god's people he chose christ over sin He burned the ships. He burned his bridges with sin. He put Christ first. The question is, have you done that? Are you doing that? It's a choice we make when we first decide to follow Jesus, and it's a choice we need to keep making over and over again. Have you burned your bridges with sin? I don't mean are you sinless now. None of us are. I don't mean are you free from the struggles of temptation, of living in this fallen world. None of us will be until Christ comes again or he takes us home. But I do mean, do you see Christ as better than sin? Do you truly have a desire to make a break with sin and are you seeking every day to put him ahead of the desires of your sinful nature? Are you still sitting on the fence? Are you still hanging around, waiting to see if maybe sin will have a better option? Are you keeping retreat available? Retreat is always easy when you keep it as an option. Don't do it that way. Burn the ships. But burning the ships is hard. I'll grant you that. Look at what the author of Hebrews says about sin. Look at the way he describes it. Sin promises a lot. The passage describes sin as pleasurable, treasurable, and visible. Sin makes you feel good. Sin seems like a good thing. Sin is a tangible thing you can feel and see. Look at verse 25. It says, Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Sin is pleasurable. The Bible says it. It promises to feel good right now. Think of what this meant for Moses. I read this week that slaves in Egypt were considered to be subhuman. The Egyptians referred to them as the walking dead. Not zombies, but literally the slaves were, were, were walking dead. They, they had no value. Put them at the level of donkeys. They were simply there to do the work. And by contrast, royalty in Egypt, they were, they were considered to be gods on earth. One text says about the Egyptian ruling elite, you call for one, a thousand answer you. You stride freely on the road. You're in front of everyone. So that was the life Moses had. Literally a God on earth. Anything he wanted. um, Everyone at his command. And he traded it in to be mistreated along with God's people. Again, look at verse 26. It says, He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Sin is treasurable. In earthly terms, sin is worth something. It has a value. 
I mean, if Moses had been selfish, if he'd been looking out for himself and himself only, he never would have left Egypt. I mean, think about the, what, what the archaeologists have found under those pyramids. Think of the gold, the treasure, the things that they buried with their dead. And then think, what kind of wealth must the nation have if that's the sort of thing, you know, King Tut's tomb, if those are the sorts of things they're willing to bury, how much treasure must they have? And Moses walked away from it. Again, look at verse 27. It says, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. It says here, God is invisible. You can't see him. But the implication is that sin is visible. Sin is tangible. Sin is right in front of you. You can see it. You can touch it. You can engage with it right now. Whereas God is much more difficult to get a hold of. And the promise of sin for Moses was that he could enjoy it right where he was. He knew what he had. He could keep it for as long as he was on earth, but instead he traded it in for the hope of something better, something even more permanent. Sin is pleasurable, treasurable, and visible. Sin promises a lot, and we often choose sin because it looks fun, it looks worth it, because it meets our desires right now. But there's one more thing we need to know about sin, and a clue about why sin might not be as good as advertised. It's up there in verse 25, one word, a single word, fleeting. Sin is temporary. Sin lasts only for a short time. It lasts for but a season. So on the surface of it, you ask, well, why would Moses ever make that trade? Why would he give up so much? But you have to see that Moses was making a long-term investment. The promises of sin were short, but the rewards of faith were long. The key is verse 26. Here's why Moses made the trade he did. He disregarded grace for the sake of Christ, or he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Obedience to Christ, even suffering for Christ, had greater value than all those treasures, all the treasures of Egypt, because Moses was taking a long-term view of things. He was looking ahead to a greater reward. Verse 27 says that he could see the one who's invisible. He could see God. Christ is so much more valuable than sin is. Now You have to see it by faith. It's not always obvious, but it's always true. Jesus is a greater long-term investment than sin will ever be. The one who's invisible is so much better than that which is immediately in front of our faces. God is the one who rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's Hebrews 11, verse 6. Moses saw that and he believed. And because he believed, he acted. He burned his ships with sin. He turned his back on Pharaoh. And he chose to be mistreated with his own people for the cause of Christ. Christians are people who burnt their bridges with sin. Not perfect people, not sinless people, not people who are above sin. But Christians are people who've made a decisive break with sin and fight against temptation. They're not people who hang around on the fence. We need to burn our bridges and throw in our lot with Christ by faith. So the question again is, does that describe you? Perhaps you have never turned your back on Egypt and sided with God's people. Today can be your day. I invite you to give yourself over to Jesus Christ. Ask him to be your Savior and your Lord. Or maybe you're sitting on the fence trying to live as a prince of Egypt and a son of Israel at the same time. Well, that won't work. Today, God is calling you to burn your bridges, throw your lot in with Christ alone and with Christ's people. Or maybe there's a sinful habit that you've not yet decided to wage spiritual war against. Today, God is calling you to kill it and bury it in the sand. Maybe there's a relationship that you're engaged in that you know is wrong or unwise. Today, God is calling you to break it off and choose Christ over the treasures of Egypt. Maybe it's something else. You know what it is. 
God knows what it is. And he's calling you today to make a decision. Can you see him? Can you see Christ? He's invisible, but can you see him by faith? He's calling you today to make a decision. Can you see the one who's invisible? He's calling you by faith. Burn your ships with sin. Let's pray. Lord, uh, well, this is about faith. We need faith to see what Moses saw. We need the faith that sees that, that the reward you have for those who follow Christ, that the, the promises for those who follow you are greater than what the world has to offer. Lord, it's easy for us to be caught up in right now what we can see, what we can feel, what we can touch, the pleasures and treasures of this world that are calling out for us to, to attend to them. It's easy, Lord, to, to settle for that. Help us um, to be decisive in our decision to follow you, our identification with you. Um, help us to burn the bridges with everything that holds us back from being wholeheartedly devoted to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Behold our God. Can you see him? Uh, can you see that he's greater than all the treasures of Egypt, that he's worth more than all the fleeting pleasures of sin? Can you see uh, that he's worth it? Um, follow him and turn your back on everything else. Um, as you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go before you to guide you, above you to watch over you, uh, behind you to protect you, beneath you to lift you up. May he go beside you to befriend you, and most of all, may he go within you to bring you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.